There are six principles for IDEA. Do you remember what they are? Zero reject is the first one. Yep, non-discriminatory evaluation. Do you remember the third? Free appropriate public education. Least restrictive environment. Due process and family school collaboration. This week, we're gonna be spending our time looking at free appropriate public education. Under this principle, we're focusing on how to support students in the classroom. The way that we support students is through looking at creating an IEP. An IEP is an individualized education program. IEPs are designed for students ages three up until they're 21 years old or until the child graduates from high school. So IEPs do not follow kids into college. IEPs are created after the students go through the RTI, through the Response to Intervention Tier 1 and Tier 2 with the SAT team, and then they're identified as needing a possible evaluation. Last week, we looked at that evaluation process so after students qualify through that evaluation process, our next step is to create an IEP. For those students who are younger than three, we still do provide special education services. But instead of creating an IEP, we look at creating what's called an Individualized Family Service Plan, an IFSP. Remember we talked about that there are not RTI services for kids under three years old or for kids in preschool. Instead, they go through the child find system and there they're identified with a disability through the child find system. The reason that we have an IFSP as opposed to an IEP is that for kids under three, we really wanna focus on early intervention, on helping families to be able to support their infants and their toddlers within the home environment. So an IFSP has similar components to an IEP, but a little bit of a different focus, more the focus on the family versus the focus on the student. So what is exactly an IEP? So an IEP is kind of two different things all stuck together. So an IEP is both a process as well as an actual finalized legal document. So an IEP is a process where families and school come together, together collaboratively, to work on creating an individualized education plan, looking at a student and deciding how to support that student. Once you have an IEP meeting, that final document that's created where all the ideas from everybody in the team are put together is really a legal document that summarizes the decisions that were made at that IEP meeting as to how to support the students. As we're looking at developing an IEP, there's kind of three big areas we're going to look at that are gonna to lead to the creation of that IEP. The first thing we want to look at is where is the student currently at? So we look at this through a page called the student profile page. I'm going to show you each of these pages here in just a minute, but we want to start with where is the student at? This is going to lead us then to looking at where does the student need to go? So once we know where they're at, what do, what's their next step? Where do we want to get them to? And so this is done through a couple different pages. One is called a present level of performance. Sometimes it's also called a present level of academic achievement and a present level of functional performance. So you'll hear all three of those terms used somewhat interchangeably. Once we know where the student needs to go, we decide how are we going to get them there? So this is where we create some goals for the student. We create an annual goal for this year. How are we going to work on getting the student to where they need to go? 
And then the services page shows what type of services are we going to provide to get them where they need to go. So this is the student profile page. We're looking at where the student is currently at. Um, so you'll notice at the top, it's really important. We want to have from the student and the family, the parents and legal guardians, to know what they want for their student, where they see their student, what kinds of things they see their student doing. Um, so we're looking at a variety of different areas here. There's student strengths, as well as if any concerns we might see in different areas like academics, in career readiness, recreation and leisure, how they're participating in the community outside of school. This is the second page of that. So again, we're looking at independent living, self-help, their social relationships, motor development skills, and any other information that we want to consider. One of the things I want you to see from looking at these different documents is that the goal of an IEP is to really take a holistic view of the student. We don't want to focus just on this student can't do math, and that's all we talk about at the meeting. We want to really look at the student as a child, all the different components that go into that student. Because quite often when we look at students, we realize that even though the student might be struggling in math, maybe there's a whole lot of other factors going on behind the scenes that are causing the student to struggle in math not just the math ability. So by looking at the student in all these different domains, we can start to identify if there's other areas of concern before we're looking just at a student's academics. Once we know kind of where the student is, we want to look at where the student needs to go. So what areas of need? So there are present levels of academic achievement, looking at what kind of academics the student is struggling with, areas of need. This could be reading, writing, math, um, science, other academic areas. And then also for per functional performance, where we're looking at things like how the student is doing in, with organization, with outside of academics. You'll notice on these pages, we do also want to make really make sure that we have student or parent input on all these different areas of need. Because sometimes what we see in the classroom can be quite different from what parents see at home. How we're getting them to where we need them to go is by creating an annual goal. So this is the page for the academic achievement goal. There's one very similar for a performance goal. Uh, functional performance goal. So you'll look at, we're looking at those different areas of need, reading, writing, math, communication. We always want to look at the standards, where we're expecting kids to get to when they're in that grade level. So looking at the common core standards, and then we're writing that goal. What are those steps we need to work with this student in order for them to be able to be successful in that common core standard? You'll notice the bottom of the screen shows objectives. So objectives are not used for all of our students who have IEPs. Objectives are only used for students with disabilities who take the alternative assessment. And what objectives are, are little small steps in order to get to the annual goal. So you can think about it kind of two different ways, either a ladder, so our goal is the top of the ladder, and our objectives are all those rungs, those little parts that the student needs to learn and master in order to get to the top of the ladder, or also something like a pie. So you have the goal is the whole big circle, the whole big pie, but we have lots of different pieces of the pie that go into learning that goal. So those are objectives, but again, they're not written for all students on IEPs, only students who take the alternative assessment. But all students who have an IEP have to have some sort of annual goal in their IEP. What are we focused on helping this student learn or be able to do? The next page shows the schedule of services. 
So the schedule of services shows what type of special education supports are we going to provide to the student in order to help them meet this annual goal. So on this page, we can list things like support from a special education teacher, support from other service providers, like a speech language therapist, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, a social worker. So we wanna write down how much support each of those people are going to be providing for that student. You'll notice we write down roles, not names. So we never wanna put down the name of somebody who's supporting a student because that can easily change throughout the year or if the student moves to a new school. But we write down the roles and how much time we're providing either each day, each week, each month. Um, and then also we're looking at where is that service being provided. So you'll see it says time in regular classroom versus time in special education setting. So how much time are we supporting the student in each of those service locations? There are a ton of other pages in IEPs, and you will see as we start to look in this module at some of the IEP samples, a lot of the other pages. But I wanted to focus in this time just on those big main components of an IEP. So the last few I want to talk about are the least restrictive environment. So we definitely need to look at where is that special education service taking place. Are we providing special education services within a general education classroom? So remember, this can look like having a special education teacher go into a general education classroom, an educational assistant going into a general education classroom, um, even service providers like a speech language therapist providing services within that general education classroom, or are the services being provided in a different setting. And this gives us a chance in the IEP to really talk about not only where those services are being provided, but why we're providing those services in different places in the school. Another main component of the IEP is the accommodations page. This is where we get to list all those different things we can do to support a student within the classroom. So are there changes to the environment we can make that would benefit the student? Are there changes to the way we present information or the way we ask students to respond to what they've learned? Are there ways we can support them for homework or classwork or testing? All those accommodations are listed on one page, on an accommodations page, which allows us to easily go back and reference this and make sure that we are providing supports for the student. At the very end of the IEP, we create what's called a prior written notice. It's called a PWN. And this can be a little confusing because it says prior. So sometimes people mistakenly think that this is created before the IEP, but it is not. It's creating, created prior to the services being provided. So after the IEP, we're gonna come and create a summary of what was discussed at the meeting. So we're going to discuss who proposed different ideas and whether or not we're going to use them in the IEP. So here's an example of a chart from a prior written notice. So you'll notice here they're looking at different um, placements for services for a student. So whether the student is in the regular education with the class with special education services 80%, or more of the day, whether they're in a combination of classes, whether they're in a completely separate environment. So in this chart at the IEP meeting, you would list under proposed by whether this was a suggestion from the district or from the parents, and then whether or not the district accepts or rejects that proposal and why. This page really gives parents a voice so if they feel that their child needs some sort of service that the district is not talked about or not thinking about, they can propose anything they feel that their, their child needs. So on this page, we would list those different things that the parents have proposed or feel like their child needs. 
At this point, the district then has the option to either accept that proposal and provide those services, and you would explain why, or reject that. And maybe we, a parent is asking for something that our assessments from the district just don't recommend. So we could reject that and look for other assessments in the future to see if that service is needed. Who is on the IEP team? We have a variety of people on the IEP team. The first one being the student. They are required to be uh, invited and a member of the IEP starting at age 14. You are welcome to invite students who are younger to come to the IEP meeting and be a part of that team. It depends on the student and their developmental levels and how much they can participate in that process. The parent and legal guardian is also required to be on the IEP team. They are required to sign for whether or not they're going to accept the services of the IEP up until the student turns 18. Once the student turns 18 years old, they then are allowed to and required to sign for their own services. You're required to have at least one general education teacher on the IEP team. So in an elementary setting, the general education teacher that's working with the student the most is quite often that teacher that's on the IEP team. But if you think about students in middle school and high school, they may be in a variety of general education teachers' classrooms throughout the day. It would be best practice to have all of those general education teachers, everyone who works with the student at that IEP meeting. Unfortunately, the reality is that we are super busy in schools. So it is really hard sometimes to get all of those general education teachers together. You need at least one general education teacher who can talk about and participate in that IEP team, um, how the student is doing in relation to the general education curriculum. You need at least one special education teacher on the IEP team. You need a representative of the local education agency, the LEA. And that's a really fancy way of just saying the school or the district. So this is somebody who knows the school and the district, who knows the resources that the school and the district has, who knows the programming, and is able to make some executive decisions. So this is quite often um, either an administrator, it can be an IEP specialist, like a representative of the special education director. It could be a lead teacher or a head teacher for special education, somebody who knows the process. And then we also want to include other service providers. They're not mandated by law, but best practice would be to have your speech language pathologist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, social worker, whoever works with that student to be a part of that that team. I posted a link to a really nice summary that you can print out of the people on the IEP team and what their roles are. We do want to remember when we're looking at IEPs and IEP meetings that collaboration really is key here. Parents and guardians, along with the student, if possible, really need to be a part of that team. They should be involved in the process of creating the IEP and the decision making. One of the ways they can be involved is by not having the IEP done ahead of time. An IEP should be, never be brought to a meeting finalized. You can bring drafts of different parts of an IEP, such as looking at where the student is in the classroom and bringing a suggestion for a goal, what you think the student's next step is, but you never wanna have that finished or set in stone. The IEP team, everybody on that team should be a part of creating that whole document. What's also nice to prepare students, prepare guardians, prepare parents ahead of time for what's gonna happen at the IEP team meeting. So teachers have had a lot of time to think about an IEP as they're preparing for it. We wanna give parents that same respect. Let them know what you're gonna be talking about at the meeting. Let them know what type of questions you're going to be asking them at the meeting, what kind of ideas you're going to be thinking about, like different areas of need, so that the parent has time to think for themselves ahead of time about what they see with their child, where they see their child at, and what they think their child needs. Nothing like being put on spot in front of a whole bunch of professionals who are sitting there at the table and they ask you questions as a parent. 
and you have not even thought about it. So help parents out. The forms we've been looking at here and the forms we will be looking at in the rest of this learning module all come from the New Mexico Public Education Department IEP forms. So they created their own basic template of what an IEP looks like. Districts can take that template and they can change it. They can add in other ideas, add in other wording to the IEP. Um, a lot of districts now use online programs and IEP creation programs where teachers type in the information. Um, but you can't take anything out of what is on that PED form. So the PED has a preschool elementary IEP, and then they also have a secondary IEP, which focuses a little bit more on transitioning to post-secondary, to college, or to career. The PED also has an IEP manual. It's called Developing Quality IEP. It has a lot of information in there, a lot of the legalities, the requirements for the different components of the IEP. So if you have questions about creating an IEP, this is a great place to go. And I put the link up there for how to get to that technical manual.